Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, politicians. Each are one to one. I'm delighted to welcome Linda Fairstein to the program today. She led the Sex Crimes Unit of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office for more than 25 years. She retired from that job, that calling, for another. She's the author of 10 crime novels. The latest, Killer Heat, has just been published by Doubleday. Your father advised you to write about what you know, and certainly you've done that with each of your novels, starring prosecutor Alex Cooper. Welcome. Good to be with you, Cheryl. You've described Alex Cooper as a younger, thinner, blonder version of yourself. And this book is based on two actual cases, those of Kathleen Ham and Yvette St. Gwilin, and is dedicated to Ham. Why? Tell me about those cases and why they uh, resonate with you. Sure. Uh, I, I create my own fictional plots, but I do draw heavily from motives and from often characters that I've met. The, the main story um, is not exactly the St. Gian story, but it, it draws from the fact, uh, as your listeners will, will know, she uh, met St. Gian was a John Jay graduate student and disappeared uh, one night after leaving a bar in Lower Manhattan, tragically found dumped by uh, the parkway in, in Brooklyn. Uh, murdered, sexually assaulted and murdered. And uh, it's the kind of case that, um, that haunted me in the real work that I did um, I, in, in a number of ways, one of which is the young woman who goes out with a friend for the evening, um, perhaps has too much to drink, and they separate. And the, the part that haunts me is the friend that walks away, you know, you've made this deal that we're, we're here together and we're leaving together, and something convinces the friend that you're safe enough to be to be left, and she wasn't. Um, it was in fact a bouncer from the bar, which is not the story of my book, but a bouncer from the bar who abducted and killed her. Um, the coincidence, the th the draw in that case, um, you will remember probably the Robert Chambers preppy murder case from 1986. Jennifer Levin, the victim in that case, was killed by Chambers after they'd been for hours together at Dorian's, a bar right. on the Upper East Side, owned by the Dorian family. Um, the bar at which this bouncer, a convicted felon who, who uh, killed St. Gian, uh, the bar at which he worked, the Falls, from which she disappeared, was um, also owned by the Dorian family. And it, it pained me 20 years later, no lessons learned by the family, underage drinking, um, employees that it's illegal to hire yeah. uh, under state law. So that's an aspect of it, um, how they stay in business and why, that I wanted to explore. Kathleen Hamm uh, really pulls at my heartstrings. It's, it's a wonderful story now. It was not at the beginning. Kathleen Hamm, uh, 1974, I was a young prosecutor, too junior to be trying rape cases. Kathleen was my age, um, was raped. Uh, she was staying in a friend's apartment in Greenwich Village. A Stranger, a burglar, broke through the fire escape, uh, came through the window uh, through a fire escape, awakened her, held a knife to her neck, and raped her. Was caught fleeing the apartment by police because a neighbor actually heard the struggle. Our laws, as you know, Cheryl, were so a antiquated in those days that the word of the victim reporting the sex crime was legally insufficient for her to testify at the trial. There had to be additional evidence. There was barely that additional evidence in, in that case. And so the jury hung. The jury didn't convict um, the man, uh, uh, Fletcher Worrell, who, who was charged with raping Kathleen Hamm. The, Kathleen's life was devastated twice, once by the rape, and second by the belief that she had failed this jury, that she had not given them what they needed to convict. And then and he went on and became a serial rapist, correct? He was not caught for 32 years. And in that period, he raped between 30 and 50 women. We know now, never caught then, right. we know now by DNA data banking. And he walked into a store in Georgia to buy a gun, was fingerprinted. The fingerprinted matched the missing bench warrant, the man who jumped bail in 1974. And then there was no forensic DNA. We had never heard the expression DNA in the criminal justice system. Now, uh, two years ago, uh, Worrell's DNA was taken. The DA's office in Manhattan, Manhattan actually found the 
sheets, the bed linens, the underwear that were Kathleen Ham, and uh, match them. This woman got the knock on our door. Uh, we've solved your case 32 years later. She uh, was terrified. She came back to New York to testify, fearing it would rip her apart again, uh, surprised pleasantly to learn how the system had changed, that laws had changed, that DNA meant that her word was not the issue. Science right. could resolve this. And ultimately, she asked me to, to tell this story uh, as part of her process. And now, 32 years later, she's speaking publicly uh, raising awareness about these issues. It was really the DNA that allowed you to convict him, to, to catch him. To catch him and, and, to, and to link him. him to all these other cases. One of the most interesting things for me about your book is how you introduced the reader to some places in and around the city that most New Yorkers probably haven't been and probably don't want to go after <laughs> this book. You know, a pretty spooky Governor's <laughs> Island, Port Tilden, there's a marshy area near Jamaica Bay, there's an abandoned island, well, an, a, a, an empty island up near West Point, uh, and, the, and then there's Breezy Point, an all-Irish community out in the Rockaways. I mean, who knew? Um, did your previous work take you to these places, or did you just become interested in them as a writer? It's really the interest as a writer. Uh, what I've done, and it's my own self-branding, uh, is is make New York City a character in the novels uh, for several reasons. One, I love exploring myself uh, and finding places I never knew about. But the other thing that my work did introduce me to was the fact that um, many of the places that seem so benign to us and welcoming, uh, you scratch the surface and there's a, there's a dark underbelly. So Death Dance, for example, was one of my earlier novels. Uh, the idea for it, it, it's set in the, in the Metropolitan Opera House in Lincoln Center. And I think all of us in the city would consider that the cultural center, uh, at least in Manhattan, of, of New York City. And in fact, in 1980, when I was a young prosecutor, a uh, violinist was murdered in the opera house during a performance. And you know I was there, that performance? Is that right? Yep. The, whoa. Well, yep. that it, it absolutely, um, I, I couldn't get my head around it when yeah. I was uh, yeah. a young part 4,000 people like you sitting in the audience being transported by, I think it was a performance of the Berlin Ballet. And, and she goes out of intermission and gets killed by, I think, a carpent carpenter. Yes, yeah. ex exactly. And because, I mean, it just never occurred to me, but because the entire backstage area is soundproofed so that the opera singers can practice, the men can move the, the sets around without being heard, people can dance and play their instruments. Nobody heard her struggle or her screams for help. So the idea for me was getting back into the opera house to to explore the, the physical setting to right. see how this could happen. So I love finding places that, again, look welcoming from the outside in, in killer heat. Um, Governor's Island. And the others are a little sinister. I might not go, but I would urge all your viewers to, to go to Governor's Island when it opens again uh, this spring. Uh, I'd see the ferry when I drove to the DA's mm -hmm. office or home from it at night. And a um, seven-minute ferry ride just next to the Staten Island Ferry, little, little boat. And I used to wonder where it went. And for 200 years, Governor's Island was a military base and nobody could go. Um, and so finally, when, when it opened up, I took the ferry over, mm -hmm. and it's got the most glorious views of Manhattan you'll ever see in your life, and it's it's a treasure island. It's uh, got these fortresses, 18th century fort fortresses that were built too to protect the harbor, that are just exquisite architecturally. Uh, Colonel's Row, this row of very very fancy houses, um, in which the military brass lived when this was was uh, an army base for 200 years, and um, it's. It's got a fascinating history. It played a role in every war that America fought mm -hmm. uh, from the Revolution on. So and it's, ha it has new life in your novel. You <laughs> I know. hope so. I hope you so. know, one thing you write about is um, sort of, and you meant, alluded to it earlier, the evolution of uh, what it's like try, trying to try rape cases, you know, previously, and, and, and how that has evolved uh, due to, to a number of, of things, one DNA. Um, is it, it, is, it is easier. I mean, a lot of rape cases don't get solved even now or don't get successfully prosecuted, but uh, it is easier because of a number of things, correct? Correct. Uh, as you know, and you've, you know this area from, from your work and your study, uh, there are 
two very basically broad categories of cases, stranger rapes, victims, as the name implies, attacked by people they don't know, and acquaintance rapes, which are family members, dates, uh, professional relationships. Stranger rapes, uh, DNA is, is the um, driving force now. The weight is taken off the victim. Most people assume that the victim is telling the truth, that the crime occurred is not the issue, but who the criminal who is, who the, is right. the issue. And uh, DNA, which we began to use in 1986 to uh, convict, to exonerate, uh, first time admitted in courts in this country in 89, and then the 90s just exploded with uses of DNA. And a decade later, the beginning of 2000, data banking, so that you could just take a profile from an unsolved case, a new one or an old one, and put it in the data bank. And we now have a convicted felon base from criminals who are in jail or have been incarcerated for a variety of crimes mandated right. that, that uh, are felonies, not just sexual assaults. There's a huge link between burglary, for example, and sexual assault. So we expanded our data banks to take DNA samples from burglars. So the stranger rape cases are, uh, used to be like finding a needle in a haystack. Mm -hmm. How do you make this identification? Now they're the easiest ones to solve. Right. DNA may not be as useful in acquaintance rapes, and there the burden, it's still much harder for the victim. There the victim's credibility is attacked. Did the crime even occur? Right. Uh, this right. is somebody she's with on a date and perhaps have been intimate with before. Why this time is she claiming force? So uh, in, in many senses, the, the burden on the victim is more difficult in a criminal courtroom in an acquaintance rape right. case. You have said that women, young women still don't understand the hazards of going out to bars alone uh, or leaving, you know, not going with their friends or, or staying behind alone. Tell, talk about that. Yes. Um, and I, I... Or what would you advise young women to do? Good, okay. I, um, I spent a career uh, trying to educate the public, if you will, about not blaming victims. And so I certainly, I start from the point that it's not the victim's fault that a rape occurs. But um, I, it's painful for all of my colleagues and myself to have seen women who become more and more vulnerable when they have choices not to be. There are some, some intersections of opportunity and vulnerability uh, that just are inescapable and, and those things are going to happen. Binge drinking is one of my peeps. When I see very intelligent women from some of the best schools in this city uh, going to bars with a friend, I went Getting to bars drunk. with friends, have a drink, have a second drink, but, but the binge, the, the being at the point where they can't remember where they are or who they're with uh, and expecting to get home safely, and I don't just mean rape, but we've seen them hit and killed by cars crossing the right. street in that condition, um, drunk, uh, I'm sorry, robbed, uh, certainly sexually assaulted. And so I spent a lot of time on campuses, as other prosecutors and police do, talking about buddy systems, talking about protect going places with friends, and there's that terrific uh, feeling of invincibility uh, when you're young and, right. and bright. There's a, I think, a very false sense of community, of, uh, excuse me, a false sense of security in, in many, many times in a college atmosphere where you think everybody is your peer and nothing can happen. Right. And yet you go to a fraternity party and, and there are cases in just about every campus community in this country where young women wake up the next day and they're in a bed undressed right, and don't right. remember how they got there. And so the advice uh, is basically don't drink to the point of drunkenness and look out for each other. Look out for, yeah, absolutely. Those two things would be, I think, would save a lot of um, uh, heartache. We have to take a short break. We'll be back with more with Linda Fairstein. Her latest book, Killer Heat, has just been published by Doubleday. Hey, Sarah. Oh my gosh, she's so cute. Been doing like I taught you. Love the new tattoo, Sarah. Dude, that's Sarah. Sarah. The girl in the pink shirt. That's the girl I was telling you about. Theater two on your left. Hey, Sarah. What color underwear today? Hey, Sarah. So when are you going to post something new? Anything you post online, anyone can see. So think before you post. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Linda Fairstein, the former head of the Sex Crime Unit in the Manhattan DA's office, and the author 
of Killer Heat, her 10th novel. Are there other cases that particularly haunt you? Yes, I mean, it's interesting. The media obviously covered a lot of crimes that we did, sometimes for the right reason, because they were of interest with, with important issues, and sometimes because the tabloids drove the, the headlines. Um, and for me, most of the cases that, that um, trouble me are, are cases that didn't get the press attention, but for one reason or another, I had a particular bond with the victim of the case. I think of so many cases from the 70s when the laws were bad, right. uh, that we couldn't do enough for the victims, and cases that, of course, once DNA um, would have made the resolution different, right. would have allowed us to get into the courtroom and win. Uh, would, there are still cases, I, I just had lunch with two dear friends who are still in the office running the cold case unit last week and, and asked them about a handful of unsolved cases that, that plagued me because uh, they were so serious and um, the crimes, I think, were not committed by an amateur, not by, committed by someone who raped once. Um, the East Side Rapist is a guy who committed 18 cases that we can link to each other some later by DNA, some by modus operandi. He's never been caught. Mm -hmm. um, and it astounds me that he committed so many crimes uh, over a period of years and that he's not in our data bank, that he was never caught. So by this point, if he were somewhere else in the country, he should have been identified if he was still raping, and perhaps he's not alive, which might answer it. But there are a lot of unsolved cases mm -hmm. that I'd love to, to uh, resolve. The British TV series Prime Suspect, starring Helen Mirren, was about a tough female murder investigator, uh, DCI Jane Tennyson, middle-aged who had to fight sexism and was really good at what she did. Um, do you do you relate to Jane Tennyson? <laughs> I do. I love that show. I mean, I think that was just one of the best uh, crime series uh, on television, and of course that called my attention to. Helen Mirren's acting, which became so much better. And uh, yes, I related to it uh, on, on a number of levels, um, the, the strong woman in a non-traditional job. I mean, I think it was harder for her even than, than mine. It, what was tough about mine was breaking in. I think young women now, where so much more is possible in the law, can be in these jobs. When I came to the DA's office in 1972 and Frank Hogan was the district attorney, there were 170 lawyers, seven of them women, and Mr. Hogan did not believe, he was a wonderful <laughs> wonderful man, a great prosecutor, but so old-fashioned that he didn't believe that women should be trying criminal cases. And he said that to me in the interview, uh, that, that he didn't think blood and guts uh, were appropriate topics for women and that it was too tawdry. It so what did you do? What did well, you do? the Appeals Bureau. He really okay. thought that we should be uh, doing the more elevated intellectual work, reading the briefs from the, 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 the cases, trials, the trials, right? and writing them and arguing those without witnesses, without physical evidence, without uh, autopsy reports arguing those in, in the higher courts. So just lucky for me that that door was beginning to open a little bit at the end of Mr. Hogan's tenure and that Bob Morgenthau um, had very different views about diversity of all kinds and kicked them open a lot further. Now, the uh, the district attorney in, in your book, what's his name? Paul uh, Battaglia. Right. He seems to be a rather uh, heroic figure. I mean, <laughs> uh, was he based on Robert Morgenthau? And, he is. He is. Most people can tell from the cigar smoke ah. that starts at about <laughs> uh, 7.30 in the morning. Uh, and it very much um, had that mentoring relationship uh, for me where uh, Mr. Morgenthau was, um, gave me enormous latitude when I was a very young prosecutor and this field was new to do creative and extraordinary things. And I would go to him over and over again and say, you know, when the New York Times or the Daily News reports on this, I'm, I was the unknown. Nobody in 1977, 78 was going to write about me, but the finger would point to him. And he just had this, the, the do what you think is right mm -hmm. mantra, that if, if we believed in the victim and the case, go to trial. If we believed that the crime hadn't occurred and it was a false report, don't do it. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and he um, tried to keep away from the press, keep us away from the press. So all of these, most of these little traits find their way into uh, my fictional 
district attorney. Mm -hmm. Now, the TV show Law and Order Special Victims Unit is basically based on the work that your unit did. Are you a consultant to that show? No, I don't You're get not? a nickel. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh. It's uh, I, Dick Wolf. Uh, you know, obviously with, with the show they call the Mothership, the main Law and Order, uh, had the reputation of pulling cases, ripping cases from the headlines, and, and uh, he had the idea based on our unit and the. I think pioneering work we were doing uh, to to create this show, um, especially to, to handle these crimes, which he obviously found interesting. And he created the characters, set them up, um, asked me to meet with them, uh, which Mr. Morgenthau let me do just for fun and for the spirit of mm -hmm. it. And I don't, I never dreamed no of the residuals. show. <laughs> no, no residuals. No residuals. <laughs> no. Would but, be nice. But you do continue to work as a consultant to prosecutors' offices. Yes. Um, Pro bono, it's something, I love it. I miss it every day. Uh -huh, really? And uh, I get a lot of calls from around the country, uh, smaller offices sometimes, uh, where they've got a particular case and, and don't know how to investigate it or would like a model to, to work better with it. So I like to do that. Do the novels spur them to call you or is it? It's a great question, Cheryl. It's become the novels now. Um, uh, I have a website, uh, which is just my name. It's got a great little video of Governor's Island on it. And uh, now I get just as much mail that way. Dear Miss, Dear Miss Fairstein, I read your most recent book and I read the flap and didn't know you'd been a prosecutor mm -hmm. for 30 years. So some of it comes through the front door. Uh, I still do a lot of lecturing and training for police and prosecutors around the country, so some of it comes in that way, but I do get a lot of questions through the novels. Is there a writer who influenced you? I know you were an English major in college. Um, is there a writer who influenced you a lot? I would say for me, it, in adolescence, it was finding um, first Poe and then Arthur Conan Doyle uh, with the Sherlock Holmes stories that drew me to both crime, suspense, solid stories that had an element that needed to be solved, um, and also just pure, flat-out good storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, I can read and reread those stories over and over again. It was, it was my dream to write fiction when I was in high school, and the reason I became an English, English literature major at college and didn't think I could support myself, and uh, public service was my other pull, but I never abandoned that dream. And it was not to write the great American novel. I mean, it was always to do something with the crime story. And, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the Conan Doyle influence. Wow. Why do you think people like crime stories so much? I'm asked that a fair amount as I travel in bookstores because it, it, it's, it does seem odd that whenever you look at the Times bestseller list, that at least six, seven of the 15 books on that list are about murder and violent crime. Um, there are those who say that, that uh, many people like them because at the end they're, they're sort of about people's worst fears, but they're resolved at the end and they're, they're solved and the, the moral order of the universe is restored. Um, and so I've heard P.D. James and you know, some of the, the um, grand poobahs in this field talk about that. Um, I, I don't understand completely. I think now, uh, for the last decade, there is a tremendous interest in the forensic work that's been done and right. these just dazzling scientific techniques like DNA that continue to be more refined that have given birth to all the court TV true crime shows. So. I think some of it is is the old view, um, and those of us who who do use cutting edge forensics find that many people come to to learn how that's done. But we were talking about CSI, and we were saying if if, if people had the budgets to to <laughs> to hire all of these kinds of experts and have this, all this kinds of technology, you know, I, I guess there'd be a lot more crime solved. Right, they <laughs> certainly would. <laughs> is there a novel you wish you had written? Is there a book you wish you had written? Oh, uh, probably a, quite a several. Few. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love something. I, I love really dense. So would I love to have written a War and Peace or Anna Karenina? Sure. But um, uh, and and would I love to have written something like The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes? That that every time a kid reaches a certain age, a child of a friend of mine, I give a set of of books to just because they're they're wonderfully well told mm -hmm. tales. So I love books. I love to read. The answer would probably be different next week if I read something else. So is there another Alex Cooper book coming? Are they going to keep coming? They are going to keep coming. The uh, The next one is well underway, and it's um, 
the institution I I dig inside is the New York Public Library. Ah. It's all about, I love that building, and I've been from the basement, which is the actually structure of the old reservoir uh -huh. in New York, and uh, rare books, rare maps, the world of collecting, and, and all the treasures in that library, which are quite extraordinary. Are you going to turn that into a spooky place? Yes, I've, I've done that. <laughs> I've just told the gentleman who toured me around that it's, it's uh, very creepy. Pretty soon, no landmark in New York City will be safe. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's my plan. Well, I'm sorry we're out of time. My thanks to Linda Fairstein for joining us. Killer Heat has just been published by Doubleday. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.